my name is Chris Maddox, if those of you, uh, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and this morning, I want to start off with a little bit of history. Johann Sebastian Bach was born into the musical family of Bach's in 1685, and by the early age of 10, both of his parents were dead. Young Johann determined that he would write music in his life, and music for the glory of God. And that's exactly what he did. Most of Bach's works were explicitly biblical. Albert Schweitzer referred to him as the fifth evangelist, comparing him to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And at the age of 17, Bach became the organist at his church, and very soon after that took over the entire music ministry. During his ministry in Weimar, Germany, he wrote a new cantata every month. And even during a three-year period, him and his orchestra conducted, orchestrated, and performed a new cantata every week. At the beginning of every authentic manuscript, you will find the letters JJ, and this stands for Yesu Yava, which means Jesus help me. At the end of each original manuscript, you'll find the letters SDG, and they stand for Soli Dio Gloria, to the glory of God. Bach obviously found his outlet for worship through music. And we find that music was very instrumental in worshiping God in the Old Testament. See, music is an elemental and ancient form of art. It's emotive, and it carries with it a very uh, a difficulty to fully express itself in words. Bach said, All music should have no other end and aim than to the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music, but only a devilish hubbub. See, music has the power to touch the soul on a spiritual level. It touches emotion and connects the hearer to that moment. There's a reason that people say things like, that, that music speaks to me. There's also a reason that people say things like, that music disturbs me. This is the reason why you as a believer say things like, the, the worship this morning really, really, really moved me. Or, I didn't feel the spirit in worship this morning. Music touches our minds and our souls in a way that we can't really describe. Let's look at some examples from Psalms that demonstrate how David expressed his emotions musically. Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And then we look at Psalm 118, 1 through 4. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. And let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. I chose those because they remind me of songs that we sing in churches now. But David used music to praise God for the many blessings in his life. And he also used music to cry out to God in a way that words alone couldn't express. Many worship writers throughout history have used scriptures to form or inspire the lyrics of their songs. We're going to look at a popular example in recent history or recent times of Hillsong United's Oceans that we sung, I think, recently. You can see that there are numerous scriptures responsible for the lyrics of this song. You call me out upon the waters. We see that that's from Matthew 14, where Peter gets out of the boat. The great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, inspired by Colossians 2. In oceans deep my faith will stand. Back to the time with Peter. I will call upon your name. We see is inspired by passages in Psalms, Lamentations, Joel, Matthew, and Romans. And keep my eyes above the waves, going back again to Matthew. When oceans rise, Genesis, I'm sure that was in relation to Noah and Psalms. 
My soul will rest in your embrace. Jeremiah crying out. For I am yours and you are mine. It's from the Song of Solomon. The psalmist tells us to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Psalm 98 verse 4. Shout, to, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. So it is appropriate, I think, that we use music during our our time of worship to to lift praise to God. Even the priests in the temple used instruments and vocal praise to worship. 2 Chronicles 5, 12 through 13. And the Levites, who were musicians, were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar playing cymbals, lyres, and harps. They were joined by 120 priests who were playing trumpets. The trumpeters and singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. See, we often like to think of worship in a limited, two-dimensional type of view. We typically refer to the time in our service um, of worship or praise and worship. And yes, it is true that songs of praise are a big part of how we take part in worshiping God. But worship of our Creator, I think, is so much more than just praise through song. See, if you limit your worship to God, to just music, you create some problems for your own self. You will end up limiting your ability to worship based on how the music makes you feel. Or you will limit your worship based on whether or not you like the type of music being played. We've all sat on different sides of the argument, maybe, of hymns versus praise choruses. But the thing we need to remember is that the music is not for us. It's for God. Have you ever heard someone say, I didn't like the worship service this morning, or I didn't like that song? I've always wanted to say, well, that's okay, it wasn't for you. (laughs) But I don't, because my mom told me to be nice, so. (laughs) But the truth is that God doesn't have a preference between traditional or contemporary. God cares about the heart of the worshiper. Make a joyful noise. I think it's really hard to be joyful when you're more focused on music style or how loud something is or if somebody sounds off pitch. But the point I want to communicate is that music is not the only means by which we can or even should worship God. Music attends to our feelings and our emotions. But just as we are not simply emotional beings, there's more depth to our existence, so there is also more to worship. As much as scripture talks about types of music and the music to worship, there is also numerous references to finance throughout scripture. Many references are wisdom for the the individual, for personal stewardship, but we also see references to, uh, in the Old Testament, of financial blessings being offered back to God in as a thank you for the blessings that he's given. Or we see in the New Testament how the new church would sell possessions or property and give their money to the church for evangelism purposes. Financial giving to the Lord or to others is equally a form of worship. Let's look at Genesis 14, 19 through 20, where we first see this idea of giving back. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, that delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. See, even as far back as Abram, before he was Abraham, we see giving back to God as a thanksgiving offering for the blessing that Abram received. And this sets the tone for the rest of history of how we are to give back to the Lord. And we see that Abram gave a tenth, or we use the word tithe. This is a portion, a percentage, so that we have an idea of what's appropriate. And we're going to see some some changing in that in a minute. But Abram demonstrates how we are to give back to God as a thanksgiving for what we have been blessed with. 
God has blessed you with your income. He continues to bless you and your family with financial stability. I think of a time when I was in college and I worked one summer for a resort company um, in their IT department. And it was an internship, so it was kind of, you know, start and end was pretty short. But I remember going to my supervisor one morning and saying, listen, I think this week is going to be my last week because school is starting soon and my school schedule is just not going to work with the schedule here. So that, that ended amicably, but that night was a Thursday. I went to uh, worship band practice that night, and I was speaking with the soundboard guy who just happened to be a Chick-fil-A operator. I'm sure you can see where this is going. And we were talking about his business, just chit-chatting, and um, he said, hey, listen, I'm looking to fill this position at my restaurant in, in marketing, and if you happen upon somebody who, you know, you think would be a good fit for the job, let me know. And I said, well, just so happens I quit my job this morning. I'm interested. And God blessed me with a job just as I was leaving another. And the one that he led me to allowed me to provide for me and my wife for the next two years. And then that job was a stepping stone, gave me credibility to get the job that I have now. How could I not give thanks to God for blessing me in that way? Giving is not a natural desire for mankind. It's a choice and a discipline that we have to make and continue to make. And if you are listening this morning and you feel awkward or ashamed because you struggle with this idea of tithing or giving, you're not alone. The Barna Group conducted some research back in 2013 regarding tithing rates. And the research showed that 5% of adults qualified as having tithe, giving 10% or more of their income to a church or a nonprofit organization. And among born-again Christians, only 12% tithed in 2012, which is on par with the average for the past decade. Can you imagine if only 12% of Christians, obeyed other commands by God. But again, we are not alone in this. The Israelites also struggled to a great degree with this idea of tithing. So much so, in fact, that God actually rebukes them for, for stealing from him. In Malachi 3, verse 8, we see God is speaking to the, to the nation of Israel. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. The tithe was an expectation, but it's not for God's benefit. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but God's power is not derived from how much money is in his bank account. God does not call for giving because of what it does for him, but rather what it does for us. Again, worship through giving is for the benefit of the giver, and it benefits us, I think, in three main ways. First thing is giving tests and strengthens our obedience. God called for our tithe, or our 10%, and our submission to that demonstrates our obedience to the Father. When we look at our finances as solely ours, it's hard to see our giving as much more than a deposit into the, banks, or into the church's bank account. But when we see our possessions and our money as God's possessions— as his money, that we are just simply stewards of. It's easier for us to see what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to honor him through our giving. If we truly see ourselves as servants and stewards, then obeying his command for a tithe should result in our obvious action to give. It's important to note, though, that the word tithe is not used one time in the New Testament. Instead, we see Luke, we see in Luke that Jesus commands the rich young ruler 
to sell all of his possessions and give them to the poor. So we just went from giving 10% to giving everything. How do you guys like those numbers? We also see the apostles' command for giving to take place, both to the church and to the poor. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come to collect, uh, when I come, no collections will need to be made. Acts 2, 35. Remembering the words of the Lord, Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But how much money? What percentage? Do I tithe off the net or off the gross? Do I need to tithe my tax, in, my tax refund? These are the questions that have plagued the first world Christian for the last century. And the answer to these questions are really between you and God and your spouse if you're blessed in that area. The key, I think, to understanding the idea of why we should give is really simple. God commanded it. That's it. I want to be clear about something, though. There is no evidence in Scripture that says that giving is is connected to your salvation. How much you give or don't give will not affect how big your mansion in glory is. The second thing that giving does for us is it helps our investment in kingdom work. When we feel like we contribute to something, we have a personal, emotional, or even spiritual connection to it. Matthew 6.20 But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see this on the road every day, in bumper stickers supporting things like Relay for Life or Wounded Warrior Project, or you fill in the blank. Barna also reported that a person's religious identification has a lot to do with whether or not they donate uh, to causes they believe in. And evangelicals were far and away the group most likely to donate money, items, or time as a volunteer. And more than three-quarters, 79%, have donated money in the last year. 79%, but only 12 tithe to their church. We like the idea of contributing to something bigger than ourselves. Giving allows us to get invested and feel a part of the cause of Christ. The third thing giving does is it helps us learn to trust God better. We've always been taught to save our money for a rainy day or to have an emergency fund or to save for retirement. And this is very wise instruction. I won't downplay that. But there are times in our lives where the only way to overcome a difficult financial situation is through God's providence. When Tabby and I were first married, uh, literally less than a month, I remember we were both working two jobs and going to school full time. And when we would do our budget, we would project how many hours we would have to work just to make ends meet that week. And I remember one, day, one time I was doing the budget, and she was at work, and it was payday. And I sent her a text message, and I said, we need your check tonight to be $403 in order to make the bills. And this was the picture message that I got back. Yep. Interesting evening. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? See, God provides for us in the midst of our trusting him. He provides our needs. He tells us to test him when our giving Not so that we can achieve prosperity, but so we can strengthen our trust in his power and provision. Giving is how we honor and worship God through our finances and our possessions. And as humans, I think we care about money and status too much. Giving is how God helps us gain some humility. You can't receive monetarily when you live your life with a clenched fist. 
But when you live your life with an open palm mentality, you allow dollars to leave your hand and go bless others, or you also allow God to give you blessing. Many people want to argue, well, I don't have enough money in my budget to to tithe regularly. But even the widow who gave only two mites, all that she had, she gave 100%, gave more than those that gave 10%. See, she wasn't concerned with the money. She was concerned with worshiping God. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, You must each decide in your heart how much you will give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. And giving is not about how much it is. It's about your heart and your attitude. There's another area where attitude is really key, and that's at work. Worship is a spiritual action. Worship is about giving all of yourself to the Lord. We see in Romans 12:1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Your life entirely, should be an act of worship. Let's examine for a second how our jobs are an act of worship. Colossians 3.23, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Work as for the Lord. If God asked you to complete a task, would you do it half-hearted or would you give your best effort? I would hope you'd give it your best, unlike what we see from Cain in Genesis, chapter 4, verse 2 through 7. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock, The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Abel gave his best offering. He gave from what he worked, the flocks. And he gave some of the most valuable portions of those flocks. Cain did not give his best and was seen less favorably. And this isn't about meat versus vegetables or produce. It's not about the kind of offering. Cain was giving what wouldn't have been acceptable at the marketplace. He was giving what wasn't even acceptable to man. So why should he have thought it was acceptable to give it to God? If our work isn't acceptable for man... How can God take it as an honorable offering? We see the same behavior played out all through the Old Testament, though. Malachi 1, verses 14. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. If we fail to give our best effort to God, our offering is seen as disgraceful. We should feel privileged to be able to give God our best effort and our best offering. Why should we give him anything less than our best when he gave us his best, Christ Jesus? But how do my actions at work reflect on my offering? How does my job at the government or at the hospital or at the restaurant reflect and honor God? Again, look back at Romans 12. Our bodies... Our lives are a living sacrifice to the Lord. We treat our jobs as a means to an end, a way to simply pay some bills and provide for our family. And that's fine. But we should also seek to honor those that we work for. By doing so, we honor God. We have to take a selfless perspective on our work. It can't be just about getting ahead and climbing some corporate ladder and stepping on the heads of those around us while we get there. Working to honor God 
is about serving others and doing our job to benefit those who have entrusted us with stewardship. Chick-fil-A's corporate purpose is this, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us, to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. As a manager of a Chick-fil-A restaurant, I have the opportunity to glorify God daily by being a faithful steward of my operator's business. But there's another strong demonstration other than work of honoring others, and it's seen in the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment of the Army. Many of you will recall that in late January 2016, there was a snowstorm that buried our communities in a couple feet of snow. But the snowstorm bearing down on our nation's capital did not stop the small group of soldiers who continually stand guard at the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery. Much as they did during Superstorm Sandy in 2012, Tomb Sentinels braved the elements to continue guarding the hallowed memorial. Since April 6, 1948, Tomb Sentinels from the Army's 3rd Infantry Regiment, the Old Guard, have guarded the tomb for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, regardless of the weather. A relief typically consists of six tomb sentinels who serve a 24-hour shift guarding the tombs, and they turn over watch of the tombs to another relief every morning at 6 a.m. They turn over watch, and but Arlington National Cemetery, I apologize, Arlington National Cemetery closed its doors on Friday, January 22nd at noon and remained closed throughout the rest of that weekend. But the turnover of reliefs took place Saturday and Sunday mornings. The tomb sentinels are a familiar sight to most tourists who visit Arlington National Cemetery. Dressed in their dress blue uniforms, they walk the mat on the plaza in front of the white marble sarcophagus. And the sentinels march in front of the tomb for 21 paces and then face north to stand at attention for 21 seconds before marching 21 paces in the other direction. But for the snowstorm, the sentinels continually shoveled snow from the plaza so that it did not accumulate and impede their duty. That is some serious dedication. And it isn't for their own gain or their own glory. It's for their selfless desire to give honor to those who gave their all. We should also strive to give honor to the one who gave his all so that we could have salvation. And the best way I think that you can do this is by living your life as though you are working for the Lord. The Greek sculptor Phidias had high standards when he was carving the statue of Athena for the Acropolis in Greece. He was busy chiseling the strands of hair on the back of her head when an onlooker commented, that statue is to stand 100 feet high with its back to a marble wall. Who will ever know what details you are putting back there? And Phidias replied, I will. See, worship of God is not just simply songs of praise. We worship through our finances and our work as well. And we need to, maybe we need to change our mindset about some of these things in our lives. Maybe we need to change some of our behavior as well. Maybe you find yourself coming to church on Sunday morning, punching your Christian time card, singing a few songs, hearing the preacher talk for 30-ish minutes, and then heading straight back out the door, forgetting about what just occurred, much the way we do when we punch out of our jobs for the day. See, we can't just clock in and clock out as Christians. Worship is through our lives. We worship God through our finances. We worship God when we lift praises to him in prayer and song. Making a joyful noise isn't just about singing a song or two in the car or at church. He told us to make a joyful noise, but he also loves the cheerful giver. And he honors the one and blesses the one who works hard. Maybe you need to step it up at work. Maybe you need to sit down with your spouse 
and look over your budget and figure out where you can give and make giving a discipline. This morning, it may be time for you to make a decision for Christ, to follow him, or maybe to recommit your life. If you are sitting here this morning and you want to talk with somebody about making a decision, about getting baptized, or about becoming a member here at SCC, please go ahead and mark that on your connection card and put it in the offering bag as it is passed. This morning, this is also the time of our service where we have the opportunity to worship through giving. So this morning, I challenge you to think about those things in your life, those aspects of your life where maybe you need to plug in to worship better. This morning, I just want to remind you not to give reluctantly or out of being pressured, but because it brings you joy. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning thankful for the opportunity that I have to do ministry here with the people of Severn Christian Church, and I thank you so much for the men and women that I get to serve beside. Father, I ask that you would honor them this morning and bless them in their lives, and that you would just help them to see you in the different aspects of their lives where you continually bless them and show your love for them. Father, please bless this moment where we Offer up to you a thanksgiving through praise of of what you've blessed us with. Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die on a cross for us so that we could meet here today and have salvation and connection with you. Father, be with us today. Pray us all these things in your son's name. Amen.